Hello everyone, this is Gerald Salenti and we're honored today to have with us as a guest Regis Tremblay and he's a gentleman coming to us from Crimea. And Crimea, of course, is the place that we keep hearing in, uh, from the U.S. media how the, uh, Russia invaded it and took it over in 2014 after the U.S. coup, oh, we can't say that, of the Ukraine government. And, of course, they didn't invade it. They've been there for, what, since 17-something, and they had ports over there, and they had a vote in Crimea that was... Uh, monitored by international observers. Over 80% of the people turned out to vote. 96% or more voted to not be a part of Ukraine. So thank you very much, Regis, for being with us today. And please tell everyone uh, who you are and, and what you do. Well, thank you for having me, Gerald. Um, I am a, an American citizen. I have been living in Yalta since March of 2020, right before the thing started. And I, I started coming to Russia in 2016 because I was finishing a film and it was about the possibility of thermonuclear war between the United States and Russia. Mm. And not believing the United States propaganda, I had to come to Ukraine and Russia to see for myself and to find out the truth if I could. I returned in 2018 and 2019 and decided to come here in 2020 to continue filmmaking, trying to show the United States and Western audience the truth about life in Russia, but especially in Crimea. I'm living in Yalta. And I started a podcast uh, about 18 months ago, done 170 shows. The intention and the purpose is to counter the American and Western narrative about all things Russian, all things Crimean, and all things about this intervention of Russia into Ukraine. So in a nutshell, that's, that's who I am, and that's what I'm doing here um, in the Crimea. So you're a film producer then, uh, is that it? Is that your I, career? I, I st uh, well, that was my later life career. I actually started in about 2010 with a film that I made in uh, South Korea on Jeju Island. The oh, name wow. of the film was The Ghosts of Jeju. It was ignored and banned in the United States because it exposed an atrocity committed by the United States military and military government in South Korea immediately after World War II, when the Koreans thought they were liberated from 35 years of Japanese occupation. There was an uprising of uh, peasants on Jeju Island that the United States feared was a red uprising, and they wanted to show Washington that they were containing it. And some 30,000 citizens over a period of about a year were massacred oh. uh, under the control organization, e equipping and managing of the United States military. So that was the first major film that I made. And then I, I made a film called 30 Seconds to Midnight. And it posed the existential, existential threat uh, to life on the planet of climate change and thermonuclear war. And I, I, I named it at the time 30 Seconds to Midnight because that's how close I thought we were. Were I to issue that film today, publish it today, I would probably say 10 seconds and counting. That, that's how close I think we are, either by design or most probably some kind of a misjudgment, an accident. And then I made a third documentary after coming here called Who Are These Russians and Why Do We Hate Them? It's actually a historical documentary uh, tracing the Russophobia in the United States going back 75 or 80 years. So in a nutshell, that's who I am. That's what I'm doing, Gerald. You know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, I'm born in 1946, and um, they had us hiding under desks in case an atom bomb dropped that the Russians were going to drop. 
I mean, can you imagine, again, the same stupidity of when you're in an airplane, you have to wear a mask, uh, not when you're eating or drinking, but because the virus, the coronavirus knows when you're eating and drinking, so it doesn't enter into your mouth or nose. And, but after you finish eating and drinking, you got to put the mask on. And when you walk into a restaurant, you got to walk in with a mask on, but when you sit down, you don't need the mask to eat or drink because the virus doesn't go to table length. It's only up here. I'm mentioning the stupidity and arrogance and morons that rule our lives, having scaring the shit out of me and other kids hiding under a desk like this it's going to make a fucking difference if a bomb goes off and you're under a desk. And then when we got too big to get under the desk, they had us standing against the walls like this in the hallway. And they'd say, if you see a flash, don't look at it. If you see a flash, boom, you're dust in a second. These are the same people that are selling their hate and hysteria about the Russians. And no clearer example than President Joe Biden calling Vladimir Putin a war criminal. Oh, you mean he joined the, the Bush, Obama, Clinton war criminal club? Of all the wars that they just they committed? Oh, the Afghan war? Oh, we're gonna get that guy Osama bin Laden dead or alive. Oh, you lied us into the Iraq war. That was fine. Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. Oh, Clinton, every time he get caught with his pants down, bombs away over Baghdad, you know, killed over 500,000 Iraqi children under the age of five with the sanctions. Oh, and how about Obama? Assad has to go of Syria. Gaddafi has to go, Libya. But we, but only... Putin's the war criminal. So you join the club, join the war criminal club. So tell me what's going on out there. What do you see? And, and give us a background of, of the beginning of this and where you think it's going. Well, I have been covering this and everything leading up to it now for the last several months. I, I visited the Donbass region in, uh, for one full month in 2019 which is that part of Eastern Ukraine that separated after the coup. And I made several films showing the destruction and, and declaring and showing mass graves where in that period of 2014 and 15, 14,000 innocent civilians were bombed and shelled. It, it, was, it was horrific. I, I felt on the one hand like crying, I was emotional, and on the other hand, I was so angry to see what was happening to these people that had been organized, funded, and directed by the United States in the person of one Joseph Biden when he was vice president and he was Clinton's man in, in Ukraine, in Kiev. And so I've been following this for, for a long time now, what I understand is happening now, right now, in Ukraine with this intervention by the Russians is that they have been very deliberate in avoiding the killing of civilians. And that's why this has gone so slow. They have surrounded cities and created what they call a cauldron where nothing goes in and nothing goes out except humanitarian corridors. They have, um, they've been accused, the Russians have been accused, and I'm sure you're aware of this, of bombing a, a maternity hospital, which was fabricated, bombing a theater, which was fabricated, and other atrocities, which the neo-Nazis, and I, I don't use neo anymore, I just call them Nazis, they're direct descendants of the Nazis of 1940 to 1945. So the Russians have been using artillery, hypersonic guided missiles to destroy strategic command centers, military bases, uh, other, other military infrastructure, radar, etc. And so I follow this every day. Many times of the day, I'm watching the maps of what the Russians are doing. And they're basically taking back 
a lot of territory and and they've also surrounded Kiev with one humanitarian corridor leading out. So the largest city, Mariupol on the Azov city has been held by the Azov neo-Nazi battalion. That city, uh, the Russians and the defense forces from the Donetsk People Republic have entered the city, control everything around it and have the Nazis basically uh, contained in a steel mill, a large steel mill. And it's not going to be a matter of time. It may have even happened already, or it surely will happen very soon, that they will be eliminated. And then the focus will be on Kiev. Now, Russia's purposes are threefold for this intervention. One is to demilitarize the Ukrainian military to stop them from killing people in the eastern part of of Ukraine, Donbas, because it's continued ever since 2015. So they're going to demilitarize the Ukrainian army. The second thing that Russia declared was their objective is to denazify the country. That doesn't just mean these battalions like Idar and Nazov. It's politicians who are the heads of neo-Nazi parties and their Rada, their parliament. It's to go after all of the leaders of these Nazi organizations and gangs, as well as the previous presidents uh, of Ukraine, including Zelensky. And the third objective of, of uh, the Russians is to ensure that Ukraine becomes a neutral, sovereign, independent state, never ever to join NATO. And what this means is that Russia will install a new government and will oversee the rewriting of the Constitution to include this neutrality proclamation. So that's what's happening um, in the combat zone and why the Russians are there. Now, what is the news that, well, just before I go on to that, um, you said you were there in 2019 in Donbass. Were, th were they still, um, uh, you know, were, were the U Ukrainians still bombing into Donbass back then? Every, every single day back then and since then, including this very day, there are strongholds that are still artillery, with artillery still shelling parts of Donetsk and Lugansk. And I know you had a very good friend of mine, Russell Texas Bentley, on your show uh, a week or so ago, who I'm sure gave you the update on just exactly what's happening there. But when you when you were there, did you see it happening? No. Um, I, I, there were a couple of days when you could hear artillery in the distance. What I was focusing on was trying to interview journalists, interview uh, military personnel, and interview people who have been living in those bombed out areas along the front. That was my focus to try to show this uh, emotional uh, story about what's happened to people, little old grandmothers who are living with this terror every single day. Now, so that was that was my purpose for going there. Now, now, what is the news coverage coming out of Russia? regarding what's going on in the war? You know, Gerald, that's a really interesting question. Not a whole lot. As you know, we're involved wow. in an information war. The psychological operations, the propaganda coming from the United States is like a tsunami. The Russians are hardly doing anything. Once or twice a day, a, a general from the Russian military defense gives a report on what has happened on the ground. It never includes casualties. It only includes areas that the Russian and Donbass forces have taken and the number and um, the identification of military hardware that has been destroyed on that particular day. It's in the thousands now, but they are not they're not sending out propaganda. They're almost tight-lipped. 
Well, but I mean, they're not like, for instance, I, you know, when you talk about um, uh, Kiev and you know, see pictures like this from the New York Times and, you know, destruction of buildings everywhere. Uh, not everywhere, but they're showing a lot of, you know, a lot of destruction. And, and th that, that is true. And in most cases, what has happened is these national, nationalist forces of Ukraine, including these Nazi battalions, have been putting their artillery in apartment buildings on the top floors, top several floors of seven-story, ten-story buildings and firing from there. There are people that have been hiding in the basement now for a week or so. They've run out of water. They've run out of, uh, of food. And what Russia has been doing is extremely targeted apartments and apartment buildings where they see Ukrainian military and hardware. So a lot of those pictures, I think, are probably true. Uh, but it's not Russia's intention just to go in and blow up buildings. They want to have a Ukraine that is able to resurrect itself, rise up from the ashes with as little of the infrastructure destroyed as possible. Yeah, there's one over here today about Russian forces hit a shopping mall in Kiev. Yeah. Yeah, that, again, uh, Gerald, the the, Nizop, the uh, Nazi battalions and the Izar battalions take over places like a shopping mall. They put their artillery in there. There's pictures of this. Okay. And, and, and that's why you see the Russians will target those areas. It's not like it's loaded with people. The, the other thing that we're hearing is that, well, well, going back to what the news is, I mean, how about what, what, are, the, what are the big... Uh, uh, was it NAI or N? And what's the big one? The big uh, Russian. TASS is a state run. TASS, uh, yeah. Sputnik, Sputnik is another. Russia Today, RT. Yeah, but those uh, are the American ones. The ones in, in Russia, the, um, what's it called? N, N, I've been on it before. N, N something. It begins with an N. Yeah, big, I can't remember what it is either. But, but anyway, uh, from TASS, you're only getting, there's not big news about what's going on every day there? You know, very little. We, wow. we were watching television early on, and it was on the news. And um, I can tell you this, the reaction from people in Russia and Crimea is, is similar but different. People were shocked. And I have to tell you, it's true that there have been large protests in Russia against the war, just like there are in Europe and in the United States. Nobody wants war. People are being arrested for protesting if they are blocking traffic and interfering with commerce and daily activity. The same thing in the United States. Now in Crimea, where I live, it's really different. There's two things that are happening. One, the sanctions that the United States just placed on Russia, we were already under sanctions here, have caused a rise in food and goods, some 20 to 30% just this week. Wow. The mood here, the mood here is a different thing, and it's different than Russia. Prior to 2014, Crimea was run and governed by, uh, by Ukraine since Khrushchev handed it over. And so there's been intermarriage, Gerald. We have brothers and sisters husbands and wives who are divided over this conflict and not only divided over the issue, but they're divided geographically. Many are on both sides of the border. And it has affected people here, uh, Gerald, in a very, very serious way. Ah. I have many friends who cannot sleep at night. They're, they're horrified by the thought that they have family and that they have friends that are in this war zone and who are being killed or are hoping not to be killed. It's hard for people to even concentrate on work or whatever they're doing because it's so real to them. It, it's, it's almost like they were in the war zone. That's, that's how they feel. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a, I understand, again, you know, I, I write a magazine. This is back in 2014, the Trends Journal. 
about the United States overthrow of uh, Yanukovych and Victoria Nuland, the whole thing, all the details in there. And, but I also have a peace movement called Occupy Peace. And I'm opposed to wars like this. Uh, you know, that I think that things could have happened in a different way. And that's my feeling of it, you know. And, and, I'm, and I'm a fighter. You know, it's not like I'm one of these pacifists. You know, I used to, have, I used to teach close combat for many years, a black belt in it. Somebody tries to attack me, I, you know, I attack the attacker. You know, so I'm opposed to the way all this is going on. I understand the why, but I don't like the how. And... Um, what you're telling me about what's going on in Crimea, you know, this is the first time I've heard that, and, it, and it's very sad. What is the, now, with the, with the Russian people on the whole, what, what, what's, the, what's the sentiment? A poll was taken last week uh, by an independent firm here in Russia, 77% approval rating for Vladimir Putin. 77% approval. There is opposition, Gerald. I, I, I want to make that clear. There is opposition. Some of it is being suppressed because it's disrupting ordinary life. And um, that's no different than in the United States. Mm -hmm. I have been a peace activist uh, for many, many years. I, I, when I was in the States, I used to belong to the Veterans for Peace. And I documented many of their actions and many of their activities. Uh, I, I, I interviewed many people from a variety of peace groups, anti-nuclear groups, etc. Uh, and so my role, like you, is a fighter. I don't have a black belt, but I'm using my abilities of a filmmaker, a documentarian, to fight this narrative in the false narrative of American exceptionalism, oh, yeah. Amer America's undeclared wars, oh. and, and really genocide. It's genocide they've been committing yeah. um, since the beginning of this country, really. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. You know, it's, uh, again, as I said, you're, you're calling, they're calling Bush a, a war criminal. Uh, what's your, uh, um, Putin. Putin a war criminal, yeah. Like I said, bring Obama, Bush, Clinton, uh, Nixon, uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson, keep bringing them all in there, you know. It's one war criminal after another. Yeah. And, uh, mm. you know, I'm totally, it gets, this, I, I'm very concerned about where this is going in the sense that um, I really believe this is the beginning of World War III. Oof. Um, I, ho I hope not. Well, I again, hope, hope is, you know, hope but here's, is, you know, hope here's, is, but the, but the, you're taught, you, the hatred that the American people have for the Russians, you know, it's, it's been going on all our lives and now mm -hmm. they're building it up and building it up and building it up. Again, uh, to make this 100% clear, what's going on in Ukraine and Russia is none of my business as an American. There was a man by the name of George Washington, a real fighter, not like these little boys that couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag that love war. And his farewell address is no foreign entanglements. Not yeah. to get involved in any other countries, you know, like him, hate him, don't get involved in them. You know, don't take a position. We have no right to be involved in this. That's the bottom line. What's going on between Russia and Ukraine is not my business. This country's rotted here. The roads are rotted. The rail is a joke. 61% of the people living paycheck to paycheck. You can't afford to buy a home. Oh, and you're going to tell me how you're going to fix the problem in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's the bottom line with me. It's none of my yeah. business. Yeah. You know, you asked me where I thought this was going. I'll tell you, on one level, it's a civil war between the Donbass and Kiev, the, the separatist regions. On another level, it's a proxy war between the United States and Russia. In fact, I think it is a war between the United States and Russia. Some people have been talking, Gerald, 
about how Russia wants to divide Ukraine, take back certain sections of it, and leave the rest of it uh, on its own. I, I don't think that's the case. I see a higher geopolitical landscape that this conflict in Ukraine has to be kept going by the United States because of something very important that is hardly talked about and reported. On February 4th, President Xi of China and Putin issued a 5,000 word statement. Bottom line, they declared a multipolar world without war, but diplomacy, respecting the strict observance of international law and the UN Charter. Now, what China has seen is this greater Eurasian landmass or continent from Beijing all the way to Portugal. The one bridge, one road, economic corridor, development corridor, bimodal corridor, uniting this entire landmass. What that means is the United States' hegemon is over, and the United States knows it. And this is where Russia and China and uh, India, Pakistan, the BRICS nations, and some 20 or 30 other nations, mostly in the Southern Hemisphere, this is the future that they see. And I think it's the epic battle for the future order of the world. Unipolar world, multipolar world. Well, you know, I keep saying that the 20th century was the American century. The 21st century is going to be the Chinese century because the business of America has been war and the business of China is business. <laughs> so I yeah. see what you're saying. Thank you so much, Regis, for being on. You've given us some great insights and observations. And, you know, the... the Propaganda war between the U.S. and Russia. That's Ukraine. It's the propaganda war. And um, it, it, this is going to continue to escalate, I'm afraid. And America is going to do everything they can to keep expanding it. They're sending more troops into NATO. We have over 100,000 troops there already. And my, again, my great fear is that if we don't have peace... We're on the verge of World War III. You know, when we were kids, they teach us in school that World War I began when the Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. You know, what the, what, what's a Sarajevo and who's the Archduke, you know? It's all leading up to that. And I, I'm concerned that there's going to be a false flag or a real flag that the United States is going to rush into war and by the way, there are no peace movements going on in America about this. Right, it, yeah. It, it, it's only hate movements. And um, uh, the global economy is really suffering from the sanctions that Biden has put on and, and NATO has put on, NATO countries have put on Russia. And you're feeling it in Crimea. You're feeling it all over. The gas prices here, I went to fill my car up. Uh, this past weekend, eighty dollars, you know, eighty dollars, and for a person, you know, that's, you know, working in Walmart or, or Costco or or Starbucks or McDonald's or all these places, Home Goods, Home Depot, they can, they, this is real. This 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 is killing them. You know, it's hurting them. You know, they can't afford this. Gas prices, electric prices, everything's skyrocketing because of this. So as I always say, when all else fails, they take you to war. And I'm concerned that when the economies fail, they're going to ramp us up to war. So thank you for what you're doing and, and, and keep spreading the word of peace as well. Thanks well, so much. Thank you for having me and thank you for all you are doing with your show and with your peace movement. Um, all the more power to you, Gerald. Thank you so much. All the best.